Amen. Thank you, young people. And what an appropriate song for our young people to sing. We need the next generation to pick up that desire to have their families and their home and their lives under God. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, if you would. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. The title of the message today is, What Did He Say? What Did He Say? As you know, Jesus has been teaching and preaching for a while. He doesn't teach like the Pharisees. He teaches with authority and boldness. He knows the Scriptures and He knows the Word. They have been convicted to heart. He begins His ministry by confronting them from the very start. You remember in, even in Matthew chapter 5, His Sermon on the Mount, He confronted them right off. Their religion had totally been thwarted by their false teachings, legalism, and doctrines that they were not so. But as Jesus is teaching, it comes to Mark chapter 4, and even already in chapter 3 and verse 23, as it says, He said unto them in parables. And then in verse 2, would you look in Mark 4, He taught them many things by parables. Look in verse 10 of that same uh, chapter. When He was alone, they were about Him with the twelve, ask Him the parable. In other words, I can hear Peter saying to Andrew, after Jesus has just told this parable, uh, what did he say? Uh, Andrew, did you understand that story? Um, I don't know, says Andrew, something about a sower and the seed and the soil. We're fishermen. We're not farmers. What did he say? Did Peter, did you understand that? I don't know, but maybe we need to ask him, what does that story have anything to do with the things of God? So they asked him. Jesus taught in parables. And we're going to look at this morning what a parable is, what it meant, why did Jesus speak in parables to begin with? And the Bible tells us these things. Let's pray together. Father, help me to teach in such a way as you taught. Simple, to the point, yet profound. So simple that little children could understand His, His powerful truths. And Lord, help me to teach in such a way your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that Jesus taught them in parables. Now, what exactly was a parable? The word parable comes from two words that means placing beside or together, a comparison. Paul Tan, in his definition of a parable, said this, A parable is an extended simile whose imagery always involves facts that are true to life. The content of a parable is never fantastic or trivial. Oliver Green said this, A parable is a serious narrative that is within limits of probability of a course of action pointing to some great moral or spiritual truth. Herbert Locklear said in his book on the parables, a parable is just simply an extended simile or an illustration. You know, through the years of my preaching, I've emphasized to all my preacher boys and those that I try to disciple, is a good illustration will stick in the heart and minds of people years to come. You know, I remember sermon illustrations that have stuck with me through the years that, that sum up the whole message in that one little illustration. 
And that's what Jesus taught in parables. Now, a parable is not a fable. A fable is a fictitious story, usually using animals. Aesop's fables, you remember. A parable differs from an allegory. An allegory gives the description of one thing other than, under the image of another. An allegory gives the description uh, it, it's self-interpreting and gives the persons in it are invested with the attributes of those things that are allegorized. For instance, Jesus also taught an allegory on a number of occasions and people would misinterpret his allegory when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He would say, I am the bread of life. He was using an allegory. And he would speak and often use that method of teaching. Someone has simply defined an allegory, I mean a, a parable, as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So that's a good way to look at it. It's, it's an illustration. A simple story, an earthly story that we can identify with, but it has a spiritual truth to it. So again, let's look at the purpose that Jesus taught in parables. There are generally two reasons that Jesus taught in parables, and He gives those in verse 11 and 12. Look what He says. Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without are these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing that they may hear, but not understand. To put it simply, parable was given to reveal truth to those who were genuinely seeking it. Jesus said to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. In other words, to someone who's wanting to learn, someone whose heart is eager and says, teach me, show me, help me understand this truth. A parable is enlightening. Oh yeah, I understand that. I, I see it now. Richard Trench said about a parable, they awakened attention and excited inquiry. Clothed in parabolic dress, a truth or a moral lesson that arouses attention and itches itself on the memory. You remember even in the Old Testament parables were used. You remember Nathan told a parable to David and it roused David's anger and injustice of what was done until Nathan pointed at David and said, you're the man. Uh-oh. But also, it was not only given to reveal truth, help us understand truth, help us to see it more clearly, but it was to conceal truth. To conceal truth from those who were not receptive. It was according to the receptive receptivity of each individual's heart. In other words, uh, listen to what Jesus said. Seeing, but yet they don't perceive. Hearing, but they don't understand. Remember the religious crowd has just attributed the miracles and the works of Jesus to the devil. Their hard hearts saw the parables as silly stories. That doesn't make any sense. And it's true with our own hearts and lives. If our hearts are cold and unreceptive, the teaching and the preaching and the Word is indifferent. But if our hearts are open and receptive, a parable helps us understand it in a greater way. Let me share with you quickly some principles in understanding a parable. 
Now these are not mine. I received these years ago in one of my classes and it's helped me ever since. I'll give them to you quickly because I want to get right to this parable that we might understand it. In other words, many times Jesus would say it was a parable. In other words, is this a parable or not a parable? Well, oftentimes, Jesus would just come right out and say. And He does, in this particular story, He just says this is the parable of the sower. In fact, that's the name that Jesus gives to it uh, in this story. He calls it a parable. In fact, verse 13, Know ye not this parable? He called it the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the garment. So oftentimes, Jesus would say, this is a parable. Not all the time, but most of the time. Again, interpret the parable by the context. By the context. What is Jesus teaching on? What is He talking about? So that's an important hermeneutic principle, the context of the parable. Number three, a parable generally emphasizes one truth. I remember a professor said many years ago, he said, don't make it walk on all fours. In other words, be careful of allegorizing and going too detailed with a parable. This represents this, and this represents this, and this, and this. And you can stretch it real far and lose the impact. Most of the time, when Jesus is teaching a parable, is one central truth. And we're going to look at that one central truth this morning on this parable. And then fourth, generally names are not used. Generally speaking, Jesus is teaching in a parable, names, people's names, are not used. Well, let's look at this parable as it goes from really uh, verse 3 all the way to verse 20. We'll try to teach it in a quick, concise way and so simple that a child can understand it. In fact, if you were here for vacation Bible school, I spoke upon this subject to the kids. It was so simple. I could, I could, could we say, bring it down to, to little beginner kids. And that was kind of hard for me. I mean, you know, but I, I tried to do it. So little beginner kids could understand this parable of the sower. But then again, I tried to teach it to the junior age. It's a very simple story from farming in Jesus' day. And I believe we can all benefit from it. But notice as Jesus teaches this parable, let's read it if you would as we begin in verse 3 and listen to this farming story that Jesus gives. Hearken. In other words, listen. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. Immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. When the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He wasn't talking about this. He was talking about this. So he's given us a, a farming story, a parable. And, he, and, and what in the world does it mean? Well, isn't it a blessing that Jesus gives us the principles to help us understand what He's saying? Because He wants us to understand uh, what He's teaching. In other words, uh, first of all, there we see there are three main elements as far as in this parable that He gives. There's a sower, there's the seed, and, there's, and then there's the soil. That's the three main elements in the story. So he tells us about a sower. Now understand, in Bible times, they didn't have a John Deere tractor. So uh, when the sower went forth to sow, he took the seed out of his pouch, and what did he do? He cast it out. He threw the seed out. 
as he uh, sowed the seed. One commentator said, as Jesus was teaching there, you remember uh, from the ship uh, out on the Sea of Galilee, and as the people were the backdrop, uh, maybe, maybe in the distance, there might have been a farmer uh, on his day working. Maybe he might have been sowing his seed. And maybe Jesus took that illustration that they could all see and they would all understand. A farmer, he's out sowing and he's sowing his seed. Well, again, understand the seed. What's the purpose? He wants to sow as much seed as possible. Well, as he's throwing the seed out, some falls uh, upon the soil in different places. He said some falls uh, upon the stony place uh, and, uh, or the wayside and uh, maybe it's on the road there. It went out a little bit too far and uh, it wasn't received and the birds came uh, before it could get into the ground and took it and off they went. As he sowed the seed, some fell on the stony ground. And in Israel, if you've been over there, as I have, thank God, and there's a lot of rocks. And some fell upon the rocks. He's, he's throwing out the seed. Uh, and he didn't, it, it just went out there, fell on the rocks. And uh, maybe uh, it grew a little bit and then it wasted away. Well, some fell upon the, the, the soil there and it grew for a little while. And then the weeds got a hold of it and choked it and it died. Well, there were some that fell upon the good ground. And as it began to grow, some produced 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Well, Jesus said, okay, you heard my story. Now you need to listen and apply it in your life. Well, the disciples, they said, well, Lord, uh, we, we really don't understand. Could you help us understand this parable? And if you help us understand this one, then maybe we'll get the rest of them. So Jesus proceeds to do that. Notice what he says. Verse 13. Know ye not this parable? How then will ye know all parables? So notice he said, The sower soweth the word. Now immediately we say, Who is the sower in this story? Who is he talking about? You see, the language that's used in the story implies someone who is typically sowing the seed. And we know the story because Jesus proceeds to tell us that the seed is the Word of God. So the sower is somebody who is giving out the Word of God. Now in this context of this story, it's Jesus Himself. But in a proper application to us and to the disciples, the disciples later on, He's going to give them the seed and they're going to be the sowers. And to us, as you and I, we are to be the sowers in a broad sense. In fact, look in verse 18. Uh, Jesus says, Here, um, uh, He says, They which are so among thorns... Um, and well, in Matthew, uh, he tells the same story. In Matthew uh, 13, I think it is, in verse uh, 18, he said, Hear ye the parable of the sower. So Jesus calls it in Matthew the parable of the sower. In other words, giving out the word of God. One commentator said, God likens himself to a sower in Jeremiah 31. In Matthew 13, Jesus implies that it's Himself that Christ is the sower. One commentator said the Holy Spirit is a sower. He is one who inspires the sowers. How can we sow the seed without the inspiration and the power of the Holy Spirit that God would give us? And then we find in Matthew 28 that every Christian is to be a sower. He tells His disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What are we giving? We're giving out the Word of God. We're telling people the good news that men are sinners, but God loves sinners. In fact, He loves sinners so much that He died for sinners. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Him, and you can be one of His own. So the sower are people giving out the Word of God. Let me ask you this morning, sowers, 
Are you giving out the Word of God? Are you sowing the seed? Maybe by your witnessing? Are you sowing the seed over here at IVC? Are you sowing the seed at Kroger? Are you sowing the seed at Caterpillar? It's not just here in this church. We give the seed in our Sunday school, in our children's church. We're going to give it out in our revival as we invite others. Come and hear the seed and hear the word of God as it's proclaimed. But we should be sowing out there to our family, to our friends, and to those about us. Giving out the word of God. You know, the Lord convicted me many years ago about giving out gospel tracts. And I, 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 I was reminded this past week I was somewhere and I, and I reached for my, my pocket to find a track and I thought, oh, I didn't have a track. I didn't have a, a, a witness to give to this individual. And I said, you know, I can not only do it with a track, I can do it with my tongue. Sowing the seed. Sowing the seed. Wherever we go. See, sowing the seed is not just the work of the pastor. It's not just the work of the missionaries. In fact, it's for all of us. All of us. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. What did he say? And he gave some apostles and some prophets... And some evangelists, we're going to have an evangelist here next week. Oh, that evangelist come. He's going, to, he's going to win everybody to the Lord. No, he's not. He's going to preach the gospel, give them the word of God. But if we don't bring them, if we don't invite them, they won't hear. And he gave some the pastors and the teachers and evangelists for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Teens, are you inviting somebody to revival? How about moms and dads? Are we going to invite anybody? Well, if they come, they come. Oh, listen, it's not just revival, but we should be giving out the seed, the Word of God. The more we can sow, the better results we're going to have. God, help us in this story. But the seed, we've already picked up on that, have you not? In fact, Jesus tells us throughout the, the parable uh, on a number of occasions, He uses the, the word is sown. Heard the word. Word's sake. So we know automatically that the seed in the parable is the word of God. God's word. In fact, Peter would pick up on that illustration and talk about the power of the Word to convict and bring people to Christ. Listen to what he says in 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Human seed corrupts. It fails, it dies. But he said, of incorruptible. The implication is seed of the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Do you know that you have the most powerful seed right here? The seed that can push forth into people's lives? You know, we're having a little trouble with one of our trees over at the missionary house. Somewhere in time, it was just a little seed. But as that seed began to grow and grow and grow into a big tree, you know what it did? It began to push the sidewalk. It began to push the driveway. And it said, get out of my way. The power of that little seed. That's the power of the seed of the Word of God. It's powerful, the Bible says. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the power of the Word of God is in people's lives. That's what the seed does. Listen to what Paul said. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Isn't it sad that Christians become ashamed? What is sad is the world's getting more bold in their evil and wickedness and their lifestyle, their behavior, and their evil. And what is sad, Christians are getting intimidated and, and shy and backward and still, as Solomon said, the righteous are as bold as a lion. 
Don't be ashamed of the good news of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Hebrews tells us this seed is sharp. It's quick and powerful than any two-edged sword. James tells us, receive with meekness the engrafted word. The word that gets in the people's lives. In fact, that's what this parable is all about. Because now we come to the soil. We have a sower. People who are giving the word of God. Sowing and out. What? As many seeds as we can. Why? Because the seed is going to fall upon four different types of soil. Soil. Now what is the soil? Again, Jesus openly tells us in the parable. You know what the soil represents? The hearts of men. It's just that simple. The hearts of men. In fact, listen to what he says. The word sown in their hearts. Verse 15. Taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. What do you do with the word when it's given forth? You hear it? And where does it go from there? So the main purpose of this parable is the soil. What do we do with the seed? There's four different types of seed, soil rather, that is mentioned. First of all, he says there's the wayside. It falls uh, maybe upon a path. It doesn't get into the ground. The birds, the fowls came and they gobbled it up and flew off with it. Again, Herbert Locklear said this, the seed is on the surface. The type receives the seed by the ear, but no life ensures. This is the closed mind individual. It takes no hold because the heart is like a highway. The surface is hard and nothing can make an impression on it. The seed cannot penetrate, germinate. Therefore, the birds, the agencies of the wicked one come and what do they do? They snatch it away. You give the word of God. You, you witness to somebody, you preach or teach or share your witness or even this sermon. You might be hearing this sermon and Satan tells you, ah, oh, that's just old fogey. That's indifferent. Don't listen to that. So your heart is hardened and the devil is allowed to take the seed and it's gone. It's gone. It may be in salvation. Maybe Satan has hardened your heart to the truth of the gospel. Well, Jesus said, I am the way. No, not one of the ways. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. No devil says, oh, all roads lead to heaven. Don't listen to that narrow-minded religion. Just do good, just be good, just be sincere. A stony heart. But listen to what he says. The second falls upon the stony ground. The stony ground. They heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. But they have no root in themselves. In other words, you, you ever seen any grass growing on, on the parking lot? If you go out back, you'll see a lot of it growing. <laughs> um, but, you know, a little dirt gets on the surface and it's true in Bible times. A little dirt would get on a rock, seed land on that rock, and it would grow. It would grow for a little while. But when the sun came out, and the wind blew, persecution came. Someone said, this is the emotional mind. Jesus said, when the persecution or affliction comes, they are offended. What is described here, John Phillips said, is a profession of faith, but not a possession of faith. 
People sometimes get an intellectual assent to the truth. And again, one commentator likened it to the story of Ruth and Orpha. You remember these two sisters? Is their initial response to Naomi's testimony, Oh, we'll go with you. We'll go with you. But as soon as Orpha was confronted with the hard facts involved, what did she do? She turned back. And what is sad is that's the oftentimes people's emotional response at first. They get all excited. But it's not very deep. Persecution or hard times or difficulties. You know, that's why I believe sometimes in these third world countries you read that magazine, Voice of the Martyrs, and you hear the testimony of these that have decided to follow Christ, and it may cost them their lives. It may cost them getting beat up. It may cost them getting forsaken. Now, I'm not talking about a work salvation, but people come and say, oh, you know, I, I don't care for that. But then he talks about the thorny ground. Oh, it takes root. In fact, it, it even begins to grow. Uh, listen to what Jesus says. It says, but they, uh, and these are they which sow among the thorns, as hear the word. But he said, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. In other words, it's growing. Praise God. They're responding. Maybe they're listening. Maybe they want more truth and more truth and they begin to grow or, or not grow in, in a sense that the seed is growing in their hearts. They're receptive at first, but all of a sudden what happens? Things begin to come up in their lives. One commentator described it in this way. He said, it's worry, wealth, and wants. The cares of this world. The anxious, unrelaxing attention to the business of this present life chokes the seed, the cares of this world. Jesus said, don't focus on the temporal. Focus on the eternal things. Or maybe it's the wealth of this world. Jesus used the phrase, the deceitfulness of riches. And many people think that money... And, and all of these things uh, will bring them happiness. And they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear. Again, someone said wealthy people tend to be independent and self-sufficient. They take care of themselves. You remember the rich young ruler that came to the Lord? And Jesus said, go sell all that you have and come and follow me. He didn't tell everybody that, but he told this man that. Why? Because he loved his riches more than he did God. And oftentimes we see people, they don't want to respond to the Word of God. They don't want to give up their sin, their wickedness. Not that you have to to follow Jesus. In fact, some of the most godly people in the Bible that followed God were wealthy people. In fact, one of Jesus' disciples we heard was a wealthy person, Matthew. He was a publican. He had a nice home, a big home, big enough to have all these disciples and all of his friends. But you know what? He didn't love that more than he did God. And then Jesus said their lust of, of the things of the world, their wants, the pleasures of this life. Notice what he said. The lust of other things entering and choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. You know, again, I, I believe this parable not only applies to the unsaved who are consumed with the things of the world, maybe their good job, their good life, uh, they, got, they got all the things that they care for. They don't need God. But I believe it can apply to the Christian as well. How many times as a pastor that I've seen the Word of God take root maybe in a child's life? And they're growing and eager and want to follow the Lord. 
And oh, I would say to mom and dad, mom and dad, feed that desire, feed that hunger, feed that uh, appetite that they have while their hearts are tender and young. And what happens? The cares of the world, the call of the world begins to reach out to them. And pretty soon, uh, maybe as a junior, maybe as a teenager, or maybe even as an adult, the cares of this world begin to choke the seed that was growing in their life. Pretty soon, they don't care about going to church. They don't care about youth group and, and coming and having a good time with a group of teenagers and hearing the Word of God. They don't care about camp. They don't care about the things of the world. Or oh, they don't care about godly music. They don't care about godly standards. Why? The cares of the world is choking their Christianity. Again, one commentator said, all three hindrances to the development of the Word in a human heart are aspects of worldliness. But then he says the good ground. The good ground. Note, all of the grounds had the same seed. That's not what was different in the story. The seed remained the same. Would you note with me, now here's the key of this parable. Remember I shared with you, a parable has one central truth. Now Jesus has set up this story. He had the, the sower, he had the seed, and he had the soil, and he's telling all this story. Well, what is the, the central truth of this, all of this parable? It's found in verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground. As such, hear the word, would you underscore the word, receive it. All of the grounds heard the word. All of the ground had the seed land in their hearts and in their lives. All of the seeds heard the word. But the key difference in this parable, the one central truth is this. What kind of heart do you have to the word of God? Do you receive it? Now that word receive doesn't mean just, oh, I heard it. If hearing sermons made spiritual people, I'd give everybody CDs and, and say, here, hear all, hear all these sermons that'll make you spiritual. No, that won't make you spiritual. All of them heard it. But the difference was the good ground received it. And when he received it, he brought forth fruit. Some 30, some 60, and some 100. You see, Strong tells us that word receive means to delight in, to accept near or admit. John Phillips said this, it hears and holds the word in the heart mixed with faith and it germinates. It grows. Christianity requires three things, a sower, a good seed, and an honest hearer. All hearers are not equal. But we are not to take it that the diversity is limited to the three rates. He said of the four hearts indicated, the first one hears but heeds nothing. The second one heeds but is checked by external influences. The third heeds but is choked by internal influences. The fourth heeds and holds fast unto the harvest. That's the whole principle of this story. It's simply this. As you hear the good news of the gospel, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to reject it? Are you going to take it for a little while? Oh, and maybe even a more little while as the, the Word begins to germinate in your life, but all of a sudden your worldly friends, your, your worldly family and other people and, and cares and riches and say, Oh, no, I don't need the Lord. Or maybe, how about you, Christian? 
Maybe there was one time you were growing by leaps and bounds, loving to come to church, loving to read His Word, loving to witness, couldn't wait for revival. Oh, couldn't wait oh, for God to do something and your heart was hungry and thirsting after righteousness. But something happened. That receptiveness, that tender heart gets hardened. Barnes said this, a heart that submits itself to the full influence of truth, unchecked by cares and anxieties, under the showers and summer suns of divine race, with the heart spread open like a, a broad, luxuriant field, to the rays of the morning, to the evening dew, the gospel takes deep root and it grows. In other words, it is receptive. Are you receptive? Let me close with this story. A few years ago, I went to my brother-in-law's house. He lived in southeast Georgia. And he was single at the time, and he, he loved a garden. His grandpa had a garden. Both of his grandparents had gardens, and he grew up around gardens. So when he got married, and he said, I want a garden. Grow some of his own vegetables, and... But again, his job got him busy and working, and we were coming to see him that day. And as we pulled up in his driveway, he wasn't home from work yet, so we walked around the house looking at his garden. It was a sad garden. It was probably as big as maybe uh, this half of the church. And he had, had planted the beans and he had planted all kind of things throughout his garden. And, and you could tell that garden was wanting to grow. But it had been neglected. There were weeds, briars, thorns. You could hardly see the garden. And I stood there looking at that garden and I thought of this story. And I thought, Lord, how many allow the cares and the things of this world either to take the word away or maybe it grows a little bit or maybe it's growing for a season and then all of a sudden it gets choked and it stops growing. Oh, there could have been 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. God is wanting to bear fruit in your life. But it's all in response from your heart to this seed. How's your heart this morning? The key thought of this parable is the word receive. Receive. Would you bow with me in prayer? You reap what you sow. When you neglect the garden of your heart and you allow the cares of the world and you allow things to grow up in your life, then pretty soon your garden stops bringing forth fruit. And my prayer for this revival is... Oh, we can come every night hear revival sermons and we need to invite people, as many people to sow the seed, but that God would give us receptive hearts to the gospel, the good news. You know, I told this story to a group of kids and I had a number of hands go up and say, my heart's not what it should be. And I wonder in your heart today, only you can see it. Oh, we can fool mom and dad. We can fool the preacher. Oh, we're here at church today. But oh, our heart is so full of weeds that we're not even listening to the sermon. Is your heart that way? Would you ask God to take the weeds out this morning and this invitation time? Wouldn't it be good if Brother Barry Webb came and spoke and the seed was so well received and it brought forth a hundredfold in our church? See people saved? Help us. Lord, help in this invitation. I pray that the seed would fall upon receptive hearts today. James says it's the doer, not the hearer, that's blessed in his deed. So help us to gladly receive it into our lives 
In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to 844, would you?